afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. My name is uh, Hadun Azhari. I am a member of the club and moderating this event. And today we have the Greenpeace uh, activist and uh, experts who will uh, brief us on the situation regarding the radiation and regarding the evacuees uh, destiny. Uh, maybe some of them are not very happy with the uh, current situation and we have a, a lawyer representing, representing them. Greenpeace has been very uh, outspoken and uh, very proactive in uh, following up the situation after Fukushima crisis, nuclear crisis in March 2011 and they tried to provide us uh, with their own uh, independent account of the uh, radiation level and other uh, human crises. And they uh, called uh, many times for uh, government uh, uh, action in, in certain uh, areas. And they are really doing a lot of activities and we are very happy to have them here for a um, third or fourth time in our club. I don't remember, you do the counting. But it's good that to have them always to brief us about the latest. And uh, quick, uh, brief, a uh, quick introduction. Uh, our main speaker is Mr. Jan Van de Putte. He is a Greenpeace Belgium Energy Campaigner, Radiation Production Advisor. To his right is Mr. Uh, Mamoru Sagaguchi. He is a Greenpeace Japan Energy Campaigner. And uh, to his right also, Mr. Uh, Dadano uh, Yasushi. He is a lawyer representing the people who are uh, having some evacuation uh, issues. And to his right is an uh, interpretation from Japanese to English and vice versa. Uh, each speaker will, will talk for about uh, 10 minutes and then we will have a questions and answer. Thank you very much. So first of all, thank you for um, hosting us here again. Um, and giving us the opportunity to, given, to explain the situation, the topical situation at uh, Fukushima. Uh, I would also thank uh, Mr. Tadano for the lawyer who is actually representing evacuees and knows, knows in f first hand the situation of the difficult situation of the people living, who were living there and were evacuated. Um, so, um, we are really honored to have him here at our press conference to explain the position of those evacuees. So, um, Greenpeace has been conducting um, research in the Fukushima area since March 2011. Um, and uh, we've been doing uh, several pieces of research, including we established early in 2011 a laboratory in Tokyo uh, we had uh, ocean research with the Rainbow Warrior offshore, the uh, coast of Fukushima. Uh, but since, 2000 and since 2013, we've been focusing more specifically on the return of people, because then the lifting of the evacuation order became an important issue. First for Miyakoji, uh, which was uh, where the evacuation order was lifted in uh, April 2014, last year, then Fukawauchi in October last year, and now the government has announced uh, in June the 12th of this month that they want to return uh, a much larger number of people, like 54,800 people, back to uh, places that were previously evacuated. So actually, Greenpeace was in Itate already 27, 28 of uh, March 2011, and we called for an immediate evacuation of that area because radiation levels were extremely high. Uh, we talked to the mayor at that moment, explained him the situation, and called immediately for evacuation. It took the government till the 22nd of April to uh, evacuate this place. And yeah, we, today we know that the People in Itate, because they were evacuated so late, uh, were the population that was most exposed uh, of the whole of Japan because of the accident. So it's an important area. And it is, of course, um, if you look at the radiation maps, uh, we did some uh, research 2013-14 in Miyakoji and Kawauchi. 
uh, this, these areas. Um, and uh, Itate is this whole area here. It's actually not really a village, but a large area, 230 square kilometers uh, area. So about 6,000 population. And the government is planning to lift the evacuation order as soon as 2016, finish the decontamination work, and which would mean that uh, people would be returning there um, soon after. So one important component, one important issue I would like to raise is that, of course, since uh, 2011, radiation levels have gone down significantly um, in that area. Uh, so Itate is in this area here. Um, and you can see that uh, in the first period, the radiation levels have gone down significantly. However, the situation today is very stable. All short-living isotopes have already decayed, and cesium-134, which has a half-life of two years, um, has already decayed for more than 75%. So from now on, radiation levels will only decrease very slowly over the next decades. Erosion of the radioactivity also goes today very slowly. Um, and so this means that if people would return to that area, um, the radiation levels would remain pretty much at the level they are today, slightly decreasing, uh, which could be a very serious problem for the people. And uh, if you look at the, this map, uh, so Miyakoji was this area, Kawoche this area, and Itati actually has three different areas regarding Japanese legislation. The so-called area one, which are ready to be lifted, and then the area two, uh, where the residents are not permitted to live today, but which are prepared for, uh, for lifting the evacuation order. And then the area three, which is in a way the long-term evacuation area. And so the idea to lift the evacuation order is for all area one and all area two. And that's about 54,000 people. So it's a large number of people. And so one piece of research we did was to uh, which is very systematic, it's only one indication, is to scan the roads, which are lower contaminated in a way, or today less contaminated than uh, off-road in the forests, for instance. And so um, what we did is uh, to scan every second uh, driving at slow speed with a high efficient uh, sodium iodide scintillator equipment, so we have reliable large numbers of figures, which makes it possible to compare in the future the same area or to compare with other areas in a reliable way. Um, it's not the risk to the population because people are not living on the less contaminated roads, but it's a good tool to compare. And so of those 11,757 points we measured in April, July, um, and this is this is graph here, 96% are higher than the long-term target the government has set of 0.23 microsievert per hour, which is more or less equivalent with one millisievert per year following the Japanese uh, calculation of the Japanese authorities. And so actually uh, 30%, this part, 30% of the, of the points are above one microsievert per hour, which is more or less five millisievert per year. Uh, it's just one indication, but what you see, the difference with the same assessment we did in Miyakoji and in Kawauchi is that the situation in Itate is fundamentally different. It's much more contaminated. And when the evacuation order was lifted in Miyakoji and Kawauchi, Greenpeace's position was that this was premature, that it was not a safe place to return and people could not be forced back. Uh, they should at least have been given the choice to return back or no, also financially. Compensation payments should not be stopped. Um, but it's clear that the government is stepping up the radiation levels. They started with a lower contamination, uh, contaminated area, which is Miyakoji. Then they lifted the evacuation order in Kawauchi. And now they're preparing to lift the evacuation order even in Itate, which is much more contaminated 
and which will be much more contaminated even after the completing the, the, the decontamination work. So my colleague will now introduce the work we've been doing um, in the area over the last weeks. And so he will uh, present that uh, based on some video material we made. Uh, so please, Mama San. Yes. So our major objective of this trip uh, we conducted was capturing what is the reality of uh, evacuate uh, decontamination uh, from visual and also from the data. And as you can see here, uh, this is a forest of Itate village. Would you stop? Itate village. 75% uh, of the land in Itate is the forest like this, where decontamination plot is even do not exist. And as you can see to the left side, small area, it's one community, uh, 70 some years ago, uh, people from outside of Fukushima moved into here, but uh, only around the houses were decontaminated and surroundings were huge and vast deep forest, even not planned to the decontamination. So the situation uh, living in such land were being uh, rather forced to back such area would be uh, something over our imagination. And here we conducted the research, especially for forest and water. Water is about here, it's called the Gambe Dam, and which is used for agricultural use in the local area. So yeah, I'm going to explain the details of the findings. So if you look at this uh, image, uh, for instance, uh, we analyzed uh, contamination levels by taking uh, samples uh, around this small river. And one of the remarkable things you can see uh, is that uh, contamination levels in becquerel per kilo based on sample analysis um, in the silt of the river is between a factor two and 10 times lower than uh, in the forest soil itself. So it's a clear indication that radioactivity gets washed down uh, by water towards the Gambe Lake. Um, so in the river itself is very low le level of radioactivity. And that radioactivity from the uh, forest soil is slowly, not fast, but really slowly migrating towards the river, especially with heavy rains, and then being washed down much faster down the, downstream to Gambe Lake and possibly further. This, this whole mechanism is not yet uh, uh, very clearly understood. Uh, there's a, a large scale project by the Japanese authorities uh, which is called F-Trace. And they're also struggling to understand that and um, ex understand exactly where this radioactivity is ending up. We know that it is slowly eroding from the forest, but where it accumulates again is still a big question mark. Um, the very important element here is that this, these forests will never be con decontaminated. It is practically impossible. Um, forests are not decontaminated. A part of a few meters, up to 20 meters along the roads inside the forests, just a small corridor. They call that the decontamination of the forests, but it's not really a decontamination of the forests, which, which means that these forests here are a huge stock, immense stock of radioactivity for the future decades. Um, and which poses a potential risk for the population if they would return to that area. And another focus we had is uh, where people are living, how the situation is exactly. And as uh, Vandaputta said, surroundings of the houses like here, uh, massive forest, so that there are possibilities that even land itself is decontaminated. Uh, risk of recontamination is happening. And, and also, we, I'd like to emphasize that here you can see land around the houses were ripped off and soil is apparent 
Uh, in the countryside, like here in Japan, many people are taking care of nature and surroundings with their uh, love for the surroundings and tendering nicely. And all those efforts have taken away from their living places. Behind the mountain, you can enjoy mushroom or mountain vegetables called sansai. All were not even available for them. So the people to be forced back to here, very uh, heartbreaking. And so uh, the situation, for instance, that's just one case study, of course, uh, of this house, illustrates already a lot of problems that Japanese official uh, policy does not take into account. And so this, the decontamination around this house is not completed, but uh, let's say they're working today at the decontamination of the field further down. Um, but around this house, decontamination has been completed. And so, as my colleague said, this area here, uh, they have actually removed a topsoil, more than five centimeters, and then put new soil on top. That's the area where we find the lowest levels, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 microsievert per hour. However, this forest, which is partly decontaminated, yeah, you can see it here, it's like stripped off, like 20 meters high. There, the, air, the radiation levels are still very high, 1.8 microsievert per hour, which explains why inside the house, at the back of the house, we find quite high radiation levels inside the house, 1.6 microsievert per hour. Um, and the, the problem there is that uh, the geometry of this forest, of course, radiates. It's a, a screen like radiating uh, gamma rays into the house. And official policy does not take into account that you can have a hill, a, s a steep hill behind the house. And many houses have that kind of situation in, in, in Tati, actually, in a mountainous area. And then also interesting is that this field, which has been half decontaminated, and half not decontaminated, that in this, this, this piece, actually radiation levels are still, after decontamination, at 2.5 microsievert per hour. And which, using the Japanese methodology, would give you more than 10 millisievert per year. However, the person living there was, a forest, was doing forest work and is, of course, working outside much, many hours more than eight hours as assumed by the Japanese authorities. So the Japanese calculation is eight hours living outside, 16 hours inside, but those people living in that area have an outdoor life. So this whole methodology uh, is actually underestimating the risk to those people if they would return and lead a normal life. The, the reality would be if they would return that they would probably have to live more inside or keep their kids inside, which is not uh, a beneficial situation. So the further situation is, of course, and this is illustrating how they are decontaminating the, the forests. This is a, an area you can see the rope there. Oh. Um, so, and in that area, um, the, the forest is actually decontaminated for this strip of 20 meters. And uh, which is not really a full decontamination of the forest. At maximum, to up to 7,000 workers were working only in Itate to decontaminate that area. So it's a huge uh, workforce doing this already for more than a year. And it will take at least another year to complete this operation, if ever. Um, this is, of course, resulting in massive amounts of waste, which are piling up in Itate about everywhere. Um, and so this will be stored temporary, but we can assume safely that it will stay in Itate for a pretty long time. Officially, it will not. But uh, this is further and further piling up. And um, without, at this moment, a clear prospect of removing that waste. Today, in December, actually, last year, there were already 3 million cubic meters of those bags uh, already uh, produced by decontamination work. And the, the plan is to have about 20 to 30 million cubic meters decontamination waste uh, developed over time. 
So I would now like to give the floor to Mr. Tadano to explain the position of uh, the my name is Tadano. I'm a lawyer. I've dealt with a lot of lawsuits to stop the nuclear power plants. But on the other hand, I'm also defending many of the villages from or many of the residents from Itate. Yeah. Itate had a population of 6,000, and about half of that, 3,029 people, have uh, gone on to pursue the. Uh, ADR or alternative dispute resolution procedures. So I am uh, uh, representing these uh, claimants. Itate is the first case where more than half of uh, a, a resident from a single uh, municipality has uh, made a, uh, or has filed for a some kind of legal uh, procedure. Uh, put another way, this is a reflection of the fact that uh, people are dissatisfied with the policies that were made by the central government, Fukushima Prefecture, and Itate Village, the administrations. Arrivas. As I was mentioned earlier, if the radiation doses are to come down, and uh, if people can resume the agriculture that they used to do, and if uh, other people are happy to eat and consume the mountain vegetables or the white wild mushrooms that are uh, grown in this area, then I'm sure uh, the most of the people, the majority of the people would like to return. But as I was mentioned earlier, in most of the areas in Itate, uh, you are unable to avoid the exposure to radiation at the rate of uh, one millisievert uh, per year. The effect of decontamination is very much limited. The national government and Fukushima pre Prefecture have uh, set forth the policy to lift the evacuation orders. Yeah. That also means uh, the termination of the compensation which has been paid on a continuous basis. If the compensation is uh, not being paid anymore, then for economic reasons, uh, some people may be forced to return to the place that you just saw earlier uh, with the house. Um, but even if you are to go back to that area, uh, what are you supposed to do? You are unable to grow vegetables or grow rice. You are unable to harvest the wild mushrooms or wild vegetables. So it does not mean that you are only there physically and that's it. Yeah. Uh, this goes without saying, but the majority of the younger generations with uh, young children uh, are saying that they do not want to go back. No meat. If the situation remains as uh, they are now, uh, then those people that would be returning uh, would be limited to the elderly folks, especially or in particular the elderly that are able to drive on their own, uh, even if the evacuation orders are to be lifted. We believe that uh, the wishes of the individual villagers should be respected, especially those that would like to go back but are unable to go back. In particular, uh, those res residents that did not own any properties, any real estate in Itate to begin with, are only receiving the consolation money of, uh, of 100,000 yen per month. Uh, that 100,000 yen per month is used to pay for various living expenses, so uh, they are facing huge difficulties in rehabilitating their lives. If the national government and the prefectural government are to lift the evacuation orders, then they should really find out what kind of needs the villagers have uh, by listening to them and try to find out what it is that, what it is that they want to do with Itate, and they should at least show the attitude that they would like to think about the future of the villagers along with the villagers. Thank you very much for your insights. We'd like to open the floor for the Q&A. Uh, please raise your hand if you have a question and proceed to the mic in the front. Who would like to take first question? Uh, my name. My name is Hiro Kujita. I met you maybe second time. Thank you for coming. Uh, I write for uh, Yuka Fuji, a uh, Japanese daily evening newspaper. I have written about this issue for three or four times. Now, um, I have, I'm have. i also a member of the uh, Scientists for Accurate Radiation Information, SARI. Uh, I'm not a scientist, a research member, and uh, our scientists say that uh, low-dose radiation is not hazardous to human health. 
for example, what I mean, Seafield. If we look at things from that viewpoint, what I mean, is safe, then evacuation is, was not necessary, and we can release the, the you know the stored store the so-called contaminated water into the ocean. I personally talked with the IAEA Secretary General here. He said it's okay to release water. So I thank you for doing the research because I can know the data. But the result of your research in terms of dose rate is so low, and I don't think it has any harmful effect to the nature as well as the you know, human lives there. So why, why, why are you so obsessed with the danger mm -hmm. of the radiation? OK. Thank you. Um, so we've taken, in Japan, after the accident, um, actually a very pragmatic and cautious position. We've put our own um, assessment of the risk of radiation largely aside because the accident happened and people had to struggle through it. Um, one, there's sufficient scientific um, literature which indicates that even a level of additional one millisievert per year is harmful. And there's a whole spectrum of publications going from what you say, one extreme is 100 millisievert, it's okay. Some people are saying this and have been saying this. And the other extreme is even far below one millisievert per year is harmful. So within those extremes, those extremes were not practical to use in the situation in, uh, in, in Japan after the accident. And so the best approach was to stick to the law, the regulations, to what ICRP had been saying. Not that Greenpeace accepts this, but after the accident, you are in an emergency situation, in a very stressful situation. It was the most practical way ahead. And so we did put our own ideas aside and ap adapted a very cautious approach there. And um, so for the, the people of Itate, the situation is actually very clear because the radiation levels are so high. Um, this is an area where even today, people could, could get more than 20 millisieverts per year. And as I explained in the beginning, 20 millisieverts per year, at the moment that the short-living isotopes are already gone. So this 20 millisieverts per year will be there next year, next year, and will add up. Lifetime exposure is a very important concept, where, um, which has not been sufficiently explore, explored in this situation. Lifetime exposure means that over the next 10 years, there might be far more than 100 millisieverts additional dose to those population. And so the concept of lifetime exposure is crucial in the, in the, today to assess the risk to that population. And for Itate, there's no doubt about that this is um, absolutely unacceptable level to send people back to. The level of decontamination, the decontamination effect, as we have observed, has very limited impact on reducing the radiation doses. And time today will also have a very limited impact on reducing the radiation levels. These two factors combined make it very dangerous for people today to return to an area where uh, up to 20 millisieverts per year. That's our assessment. It's also actually what legislation which we criticize but even the legislation um, uh, implies and the ICRP regulations recommendations sorry Aaron Charlotte Reuters thank you very much for your presentation um, have you taken these findings to the government yet and what is their response please thank you So every time we communicate this, and we have now a letter in, in your press package, there's also a letter with demands to the Japanese government. Um, let's say that my experience here over the last years has been clearly that 
uh, the communication with the Japanese government goes indirectly. I'm sure they're following what we're saying here today, but we don't have a direct communication with the government. Unfortunately, we would like to, but it doesn't seem to be possible, unfortunately. I think it's important for the government to, in the first place, to listen to the population. And what we're doing is supporting the population of Itate um, and the legal procedures. And what we're actually aiming for is that the government would listen more carefully to the concerns of the population in Itate and in the evacuated areas, and also the population in the non-evacuated areas, which have been given very little or no support till now. All right. Yeah, I would like to ask just follow-up questions. You mentioned there were some remaining long-term radiations. And uh, could you please give us what the name of the radiations still in the area? You said like uh, the cesium is this, cesium, cesium is finished, so they are a little bit long term. And secondly, what is the effect or impact of the uh, remaining radiations on the wildlife, not on the human? Thank you. So uh, two questions: the radiation, which is now primarily but not exclusively um, remaining is uh, radiation from cesium-137, um, which has a half-life of 30 years. We know also from experience in Chernobyl that this radiation will remain quite stable in, in the location. There is some migration, of course, but it's limited. And it remains in the topsoil. There's a kind of circulation of cesium through the growth of plants and redisposition on the ground with the leaves. So it stays in the top layer. It uh, doesn't really go deep in the underground. Uh, today, uh, about 90% of older cesium is in the top five centimeters still today. Um, so that's uh, the situation. Um, in uh, your other questions? Yeah, other, like you have other than cesium? Yes, and so. Um, there is, has been a release, when there was a release, especially in that area, the 15th of, uh, of March. Uh, that release, um, it is the finger, the, let's say the other isotopes, which are, for instance, plutonium-239, uh, plutonium-241, uh, which can be measured. Um, for this, th these isotopes, they have been emitted, and it can be. It, uh, literature is clearly proving that uh, some quantity has been released through very sensitive analysis. It can be demonstrated, and the fingerprint of these isotopes of plutonium can prove that it was coming from uh, Fukushima Daiichi. But in comparison with the cesium release, the cesium release has been the most important release and is today the most important factor of contamination in that area. The impact on wildlife is very important uh, and largely unexplored, uh, at least in, in Japan, uh, by the authorities so far. We have now seen in the last years the proof of how crucial a good understanding of the impact on wildlife is. In Chernobyl, uh, it has been studied in detail the impact on decreasing number of uh, what we uh, could call microorganisms, um, insects and other microorganisms which are decomposing that wood uh, in, in the forests. And so there is a much higher level of that wood in the Chernobyl uh, area, which is the cause today of many wildfires. And these wildfires, so forest fires, re-emit large quantities in the plume of the of radio cesium and other isotopes into the environment, recreating an immediate risk, imminent risk to the population, even at far distance from uh, the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. So it's clear that even 30 years, almost 30 years after Chernobyl, the disaster in Chernobyl is not over. We get new problems. And actually, it's just one example of how wildlife impacts on wildlife are also immediately impacting on humans. And of course, there's a much larger diversity of the impact on wildlife than just the ones 
that leads to an impact to humans. But um, yes, so that's a very important uh, question. Thank you. More, more questions? We have time. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, my name is Makiko Sega. I'm a freelancer and I currently work on Korean Times. And so I appreciate about the impact on wildlife. And uh, I just visited the Itate village and um, happened to meet some local photographer who taking already starting from this year, he say, some mutation on plant. I show you the photo. And I uh, hear that a um, number of insects, especially shida, um, semi, how do you say semi? Mi, 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 shikada. The shikada, the sound of shikada is decreased. Shikada, yeah? Perfect? Shikada. Shikada. Shikada is decreased. And, and thinking that, so it's not only him, but I, Kawauchi villager and also Ida the villager, and they say it's true. The sound of insect decline. And is it because, of, because uh, you investigate the soil contaminations, it's high back level, is it because of sejun, because uh, when they, become butterfly or you know, when the egg, it's because of sejum or things that's, can we deny that any link with radiation because of this symptom or because of depopulation or what you think as an environmentist to, to think about this cause why insect is declining and yeah, thank you. <laughs> so I think in the first place it's important to look at data. Yeah, and data from Chernobyl uh, is clearly showing a decrease or, for instance, insects, but also uh, birds. But insects are actually very interesting to look at. Um, the reason why it's declining is a different question. It's extremely difficult to build a model to estimate the dose to an ant or to an insect. It's very little research has been done on that. But Today, so it's just, there's some causal relationship. We have in the areas where we have more radiation, there is, there we, we observe clearly lower amount of insects and more, less decomposition of uh, that wood, for instance. That's, that's very clear. That has been researched extensively, but to the full explanation of that um, is not available yet. And we would really urge, also in Japan, uh, a lot more research in that area, uh, because it could also teach us something about um, the relationship between uh, radiation and impact uh, of radiation on, on life in more general. So it's a bit of more, more fundamental research, but it could teach us a lot about those response and uh, the impact of radiation on life. I'm sorry to add one more yeah. thing. Then it's a new plant to burn nuclear debris was built in. Did you see on the top of the Itate village? And only the politicians who had access can go into. I just by accident by one nice politician that I went into just a week ago. Power like the debris. They say, they say um, according to government, it's just a debris. They put some filter and they burning. Do you think and? <laughs> did you investigate? Why are you going to no, investigate? No, we did not or? investigate that. And of course, yeah. incineration, there are dedicated incinerators built mm -hmm. in the area, uh, also in Naraha, for instance, which are incinerating the de decontamination waste, which is burnable, like leaves and, and branches and so on. Of course, it's a very delicate operation because it could re-emit cesium yeah. into the air. And your question on the impact on plants, uh, there has been some confusion here in Fukushima. For instance, some pictures have been distributed already 2011, 2012, showing strange mm. fruits. Mm. And so some of those pictures were actually seemed uh, taken before the accident. And there was some confusion about that. So we have to be very careful with, uh, with that and really look at fundamental research um, on, for instance, the number counting of insects. Um, let's say cases of a strange looking fruit. Everyone who's growing fruit or, or vegetables knows that if you do it yourself, you get things that look very different sometimes from what you buy in the shop uh, because they don't, uh, <laughs> they're not sold in that way. So we have to be careful not to interpret everything uh, as a cause to radiation and really 
look at serious science studying this. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Mara? Of course, Japan is also famous for uh, square fruit. Um, uh, I have a question to uh, Mr. Tadano, please. Um, the, the, these findings from the most recent Greenpeace trip, are they, uh, do you plan to put them up in court, in the court cases you're involved in, or the, the arbitration you're involved in? And if so, how admissible are they, and what, do you, what effect do you think they would have on the uh, arbitration? Thank you. The answer is yes. I intend to submit the findings that are brought forth by Greenpeace. And also there are other groups that are engaged in similar surveys or um, taking measurements. So I intend to submit uh, those data as evidence as well. Just to um, add a few more comments, we don't intend to uh, really win on the basis of uh, scientific rightness. The basis behind the scientific rightness or scientific accuracy is that uh, it is not known the in, in terms of the impact of uh, low dosage um, exposure to radiation. We, ten, we intend to make an argument or assertion uh, by questioning whether it is the right policy to, to bring people back to these areas uh, in terms of society or socially speaking as a social policy, is it the right policy to have these people return to these areas, or is it a right choice to return, to have people return to the contaminated area? Because it is a matter of choice. So that's um, how we intend to argue. Right. Any more questions? Uh, is it better? OK. Um, the, the term uh, nuclear uh, Plant-related death. Nuclear plant-related. The literal translation of the term we use in the in, in media in Japan. Genpas kanlenshi. Okay, but there, there's no one so far died of radiation. And I asked this question to uh, former Prime Minister Khan when he came here uh, uh, after you know LDP became the incumbent part. He said that he knew about the low dose radiation, but he made his decision to evacuate people because of the risk of high dose radiation, he said. Well, still, I do not think you know, evacuation itself is necessary, but it, it's done anyway. Okay, so I think it's uh, high time for them to start coming back, because the radiation-wise, we have a different opinions, but not not so high. It's low, still, from my viewpoint, low dose radiation, and um, you know the people are frustrated not being able to go back to their hometown or home country. So I think, you know, it to satisfy the wants needs of those people who would like to go back. Society should help them, don't you think, Ms. Mr. Tadano? That's a difficult uh, question. Very honestly speaking, I don't have an answer for that. I'm a lawyer, so I think of uh, legal consistency. As I was mentioned earlier, uh, there is the standard, one millisievert per year. So we, we should think of uh, various other things based on this standard. And this was in the uh, statement that was made by Japan Federation of Bar Association right after the accident. And this statement was uh, quoted in many places. But um, the upper limit in the area, the restricted area where uh, radiation is used for, for instance, medical purposes and others, is still uh, kept at 5 millisievert per year. I'm, I'm sure you know this, but um, in an area where there is a radiation of 5 millisievert uh, per year or above, uh, you are not allowed to live, of course, but you're not allowed to eat or drink in that area. So I question uh, whether it is a right choice to have people return to those areas, uh, which is the case for most of uh, Itate. From a slightly different point of uh, view, I'd like to say something different. 
uh, people that are currently evacuating, people from Itate that are currently evacuating in uh, Fukushima or Minami Soma, uh, they are going back to their homes in Itate to make sure that uh, everything is okay or it's not uh, vandalized. And there is a, a mechanism or a, a system already set up allowing people to do so. So uh, factually speaking, there is already a process or procedure in place uh, where people can continue to have the evacuation at, or continue to live in evacuation, but also at the same time are uh, going back and forth between the area where they have evacuated to and uh, Itate. So the real problem is uh, what this lifting of the evacuation would mean, uh, which is to happen in two years' time, the across-the-board lifting of the evacuation order. What that means is that there will be a discontinuation of the payment of uh, compensation, the consolation money, and the other types of compensation for losses. That's where the problem is. So there are um, about 70 of the lawyers representing 3,000 people uh, from Itate, and we have talked to the heads of households. Uh, we've have, we have talked to the individuals from Itate. The claim is submitted by a household, and one household would write for about uh, five pages in size A4 paper. There are 800 households, so the claim is about 2,500 pages long. So looking at this, what I think is that Itate is different from other municipal municipalities in Fukushima. And even within Itate, uh, there are differences in opinion. And even if you are to look at the minimum unit of uh, people, the family, even within the same family, uh, there are people uh, that have, uh, there are members within the family that have different uh, opinions. And these uh, gaps are quite uh, huge at the moment. So if uh, people from Itate decided that they would not like to go back to Itate and uh, decide to rebuild their lives in Fukushima city or Minami Soma city or elsewhere, uh, they are dissatisfied with the amount of uh, compensation being paid, which is uh, not enough to go and start a new life. Use. So those people that did not own any properties in Itate, in other words, those that uh, formerly lived in rented property, uh, rented property and uh, those did not own any forests or any fields, uh, those people are only receiving 100,000 yen per month as uh, consolation money. And uh, when the evacuation orders are lifted, then they will have to move out of the temporary housing that they're currently living in. Uh, they won't be receiving this consolation money, the 100,000 yen per month uh, consolation money. And if they don't want to go back, what are they supposed to do? They would have to be on welfare. That's the current conclusion. So I really question the consequence or the outcome of the policy. Thank you. So. Um, from our organization point of view, it's clear that the area has been seriously damaged. And people having property there, their property has been severely damaged. And what the government is now asking those people to do is to smile, literally, that's what they are asked to do, uh, to be happy and to return, and not to complain. That, that is what is being asked today by the government, and ending any compensation payment. And this coercion of ending compensation payment is absolutely unacceptable for us. That's a social uh, disaster. After the first nuclear disaster in March 2011, there's now a second disaster for those people in the making of a government abandoning them and forcing them back. It's not only... Um, an individual, it's also a human rights issue, I would say, of not accepting the rights of those people to make their own choice. For Miyakoji and Kawauchi, Greenpeace has never said that people should be forbidden to go back. We think it's too dangerous for people to go back, but that's our opinion. If people really choose to do so, they should get the support to do that. We don't let our opinion interfere with that. People should get the right information. 
neutral information, uh, not the kind of information they are receiving now, which is underestimating clearly the risk of radiation. And based on that information, people should be given the right to make their own choice. But that means if they wish to do so and want to live, build a new life elsewhere, they should be given full compensation and the financial resources and support to do so. I think that's a very clear position. Thank you. I think we reached the time, but uh, I have a very short question. What is Greenpeace policy on restarting the nuclear reactors? Because now it seems the government is preparing to announce uh, one reactor being uh, restarting. Just briefly, thank you. Yes, this is, of course, what is behind this whole uh, pressure on the population to accept that everything is going back to normal what we call a kind of normalization strategy, accepting that life can simply restart in those contaminated areas as if nothing happened. Um, and the clear idea behind that is not so much financially to reduce compensation payments. Uh, in the total pack package of costs, it's not so significant. The real motivation is to make it seem that everything goes back to normal and that you can easily survive a nuclear disaster uh, and that restarting reactors uh, around Japan um, is a reasonable option. The population of Japan clearly in opinion polls clearly thinks that this is not correct. Yeah? But their opinion is not taken into account, for instance, for the restart of the reactors in Sendai, in Kagoshima. The opinion of people living at 30 kilometers, from, for instance, of, of the Sendai reactor is not asked, is not taken into account to give the permission to restart, yes or no. Whereas we see clearly in Itate, which is 28 to 47 kilometers from the reactor, much further even, yeah, that the impact is massive, is disrupting people's life. But in Kagoshima, those communities, those prefectures, which could be directly impacted severely by an accident at the Sendai nuclear power plant is disregarded. And uh, this is uh, an omission of the rights of those people to be involved in a decision that could seriously impact their future life. Thank you very much. This wraps up our uh, press conference today. Thank you very much for coming. I would like to thank Greenpeace uh, soldiers again for uh, coming here and for trying to save uh, our uh, save the issues and the people in, in the areas connect, uh, impacted by the radiation. Uh, please come again when you have very good results to show us. Thank you and have a nice evening. Thank you.